a thought for you. Is physical music now really just merchandise or definitely moving over into that area? As far as cassettes go, I definitely think it is merchandise. As far as records and CDs go, yeah, there are arguments to be had for collecting those over a streaming version. But yeah, as far as cassettes go, I definitely think those fall into merch. I mean, you see artists nowadays, they'll release on cassette as a bit of a novelty, and then they'll release like six different colours of cassette. It definitely comes into the merch kind of area, for me anyway. The, the reason I mention this is back in the day, you'd have an artist and the number one thing for them would be selling physical music, whether it's on records, tapes or CDs. That's how they made the majority of their income. But nowadays, if you were to do a pie chart of the income of a group, it would be mostly streaming and live performances. I mean, some groups, those two might alter positions as to the number one place. But then in the remainder, the kind of leftover bit for other forms of income, in amongst those would be physical music sales, whether it was records, tapes or CDs. And I think that's how they kind of a lot of the artists nowadays treat that category of things. You know, I'll do the streaming, I'll do the downloads or whatever. Oh, and yeah, by the way, I've got a few collectibles records out as well. Limited edition, you know, 500 copies type of thing. But they're not relying on that as their main source of income. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not against this idea. I understand why it's gone like that and why records, tapes and CDs are now more kind of collectibles for people buying them rather than the main form of their income. There was a survey done, I think it was six years ago now, so it's a bit out of date, but it said that 48% of people who bought vinyl records never intended to play them. They just bought them as a memento of a group. And I understand that. You buy a t-shirt, you buy a poster, you buy a record, you're supporting the artist. I mean, there's certainly been people over the years that I've bought things from people that I want to support, and I've never really used the thing that I've bought. So I'm, I'm all for that idea. But Taking this to its extreme, of course, in recent years, I've featured uh, quite a few physical media releases that go beyond records, tapes and CDs into areas where they're definitely not expecting very many people to be able to play them. I mean, we're talking mini discs here, of course, uh, but into DCC, L cassette, reel to reel, eight track cartridges. I mean, how many people have the ability to play all those things? The small artists that are releasing their music on those formats know that those are collectible things. They're not thinking, this is how I'm gonna make all my money. It's more, look, I'll sell a few of these. It gets the name around, gets a bit of publicity, and uh, some people might be able to play them. It's like a functional, Momento, much the same as a t-shirt that you buy with the name of your favorite group on. It's a t-shirt, you can wear it, but it's also merchandise. Well, same goes for a lot of these things. You could play them, but most people probably aren't going to. Well, taking that to its extreme, there are some groups that are really kind of pushing out the boundaries of the music formats that they're releasing. And one of them got in touch with me a year ago now. You might have seen this on the shelf behind me. This has been sitting there for a year. This is a new release by a duo called The Nameless Dreamers. And they put their music out on an Edison cylinder. I mean, it's on here, but how many people are gonna be able to play that? Well, you know, um, I like to be up for a challenge. And if I get something sent to me that has music on it, I, I wanna hear that music. The problem is, getting hold of an Edison cylinder player is a lot more tricky than, say, getting hold of a decent working cassette deck, and that's hard enough nowadays, especially in the UK. Don't seem to be that many around, even though at one point, of course, there would have been a load of them, but we're talking like over 100 years ago now, so these things are proper antiques. So, uh, well, just give me a second. Yeah, a few years ago, before that came in, I did buy this Edison cylinder player. This is an Edison gem, I believe. Now, I'm no expert on these. There are plenty of people online who are, so um, just take every bit of information I give you here with a bit of a pinch of salt. You're better off um, hearing about these things from someone who knows more about them. But this Edison gem, early sort of part of the 20th century, 19-0-something, and it's got a really beaten up horn on this one. I don't know where that's been. It's like aluminium and it's been bashed around over the years. But again, the age on these things, of course. Now you might wonder why I haven't ever tried playing this on this. Well, there's a good reason for that. Formats 
it's a cylinder player that will fit on the cylinder part on the top of here. In fact, I've got some other cylinders and uh, let me just show you one of these side by side. So this is a, a modern day reproduction of an old uh, cylinder and is the other one from Nameless Dreamers. Look the same, don't they? Thing is, this is a two minute cylinder and Nameless Dreamers have released a four minute cylinder. They've got two of their Vaporwave, Vaporwave? Vaporwave tracks on here for a total of four minutes. So theirs is a four minute cylinder. You can't put, well, you can put a four minute cylinder on a two minute player, but it's not gonna play it because the gearing's different. First off, obviously the speed to get from one end to the other with the needle is uh, geared differently, but also the grooves are a lot finer and closer together. So it needs a different kind of needle stylus type arrangement. So I bought this Edison Gem, which was one of the few ones that I could find in the UK at a semi reasonable price a few years ago. And then they got in touch and said, oh, we've got a cylinder. And then they told me the specs. I says, well, I can't play it. They sent it over anyway, but for the last year it's been sat there and I've been sort of thinking about it, thinking, you know what, I should get a four minute player. You see, what happened was the two minute one, that was the standard for many years. And then I think it was when Berliner came in with the 78 RPM record, that had a longer play time. And as a re reply to that really on Edison's side, he came out with the four minute cylinder to update his machine rather than just having the limitation of the two minute cylinder of the majority of them. But yeah, the majority of them that you'll find, if you do find one, which is something that's probably very unlikely just to stumble past one, but the two minute cylinders, the, the four minute players, they were later on and for a relatively limited period of time in relation to the two minute one, the two minute went for years and years. And then for the last few years, there were some four minute ones and there were ones with a gear that you could change. You'd alter the gear and you go from two minute to four minute mode. In fact, there was a later version of this gem. The gem was like the budget model and that had a four minute version, I think on one of the final editions of the gem, but this is an earlier one and it just plays two minute records. Anyway, let's just have a quick listen to a two minute cylinder, just to give you an idea as to the, the quality that you get out of this. And by the way, again, these aren't museum quality. These are not maintained to the standard that a proper machine should be. These are just some sort of cheap things. Well, this one is a cheap thing that I found on eBay. So yeah, you're not getting the perfect quality here and accurate speed, but it does work. So let's have a look at it. Now we'll play a cylinder on it in a moment, but first let's try and narrow down the date when this thing was actually manufactured. And I'm able to do that by looking at the information that's on this patent plate on the back. I'm pronouncing it patent because it's a US device and it's a US patent. In fact, there's loads of patents on here. The most recent one of which is November the 17th, 1903. Therefore we know that this particular machine was manufactured after that date. But how long after? Well, this plate design changed in 1905, May the 23rd, 1905. So we know that this was made somewhere between November the 17th, 1903 and May the 23rd, 1905. I'm sure someone will be able to read the serial number on here and tell me closer to the date, but let's just say it's around about 1904, approximately. Now, whilst I've still got the machine turned around, I wanted to show you this. This is one long worm gear, and this is a thing that drags the whole mechanism along the length of the cylinder. Unlike a 78 RPM record where the needle pulls the arm in the groove, here it's not really the groove pulling the needle, it's this worm gear that's keeping it moving along the length of the cylinder. Now at the moment this whole assembly can slide up and down freely along this bar because it's not engaging with that worm gear and it's being held up by this little stopper here and you pull that out to drop that down onto the cylinder course because we haven't got a cylinder on here at the moment it's still not engaging with the metal disc the stylus is just under here I'll take this off and it's just staying a little bit proud of that in fact we could just take it out there's a screw on the top here and if we just remove that we can lift the whole mechanism out so that's your sounder box so obviously the horn section goes on the end of here so that is the sounder mechanism the needle here or stylus really that is the section that travels along the groove on the cylinder. Just that part up there, right at the top. Okay, let's pop it back in and we'll pop a cylinder on. 
Now next to the winding handle here, this is the speed regulator. And as I turn it, you'll see this thing starts to spin. And I do find it very difficult to get this to play at the right speed. So when I'm playing these cylinders back in a moment, it's more than likely they're gonna be playing at the incorrect speed. Just tiny fractions of a millimeter of a movement on this can really alter the speed quite dramatically. Okay, so I'll wind it up now. To wind this one, you have to push it in as you turn it. I think that's fully wound there, in fact. So that just moves freely there because it's sprung back from its winding position. So let's just put a cylinder on. So you can see this one's still in its original box. Edison cold molded records echo all over the world. Picture of Edison there as well. And along the top here, it has the name of the song that's in here. It looks like it's handwritten, Who Do You Love? And it says there, the record should run at 160 revolutions per minute. In brackets, no faster. Well, good luck getting that accurate on here. Uh, but that's song 23A. So if we open this up, you might better make out along the top of here, just about, that's where the song details are. So again, it says, who do you love? Question mark. Collins and Harlan. And then it's got some details, 9727 and uh, Edison pattern information on there as well. Now, one thing that you might not know about cylinders is, well, they're not strictly cylinders. I'll, I'll just show you something. Well, as far as the outside goes, yes, it is a cylinder. As you can see, it rolls along here nice and smoothly. However, the inside of this is actually tapered. This end is narrower than that end. I'll just show you that now. So let's have a look. This end, right about 46.6. Okay, turn it around. This end, uh, 43.2. You can probably see it now on here. There's a definite slope going from a high point at this end down to a lower point at that end. And of course, once you put that on there, at some point along that slope, it will jam itself into position. Because of course, if you just had two differently sized cylinders, this thing would just spin freely over the top of the other one. So it does need to get held on there. And that's how they do it. The inside of the cylinder record and the thing that it goes on to, have just got this little slope on them that binds them together. Okay, so to put the record on here, this part slides open. That means we can now slide this over the end with the text facing outwards. And it grips it about that point there. So we'll pop this back on and we're ready to go. Well, it would be if we had the horn on the top. So let's just pop that on there. Okay, let's give it a go. Okay, so we'll lift that down now and pop it on the cylinder. Okay, now that one was running a little bit fast. Let's try another one with some speech on it because these cylinders, I bought some new ones recently um, and, well, say recently, a few years ago, and these are like reproductions of some original Edison ones. So this is the original advertising record from 1906. So let's pop that on there. You can see this one, of course, has a much clearer text on the end. And these are newly manufactured, I believe, here in the UK. Uh, so let's just pop this one on. First off, I'll, well, we'll put it on and then I'll wind it up afterwards. But yeah, just trying to get the right speed on here is really awkward because if I turn it slow enough, it just stops spinning. And then, um, so I seem to have to run it a little bit faster than it sh should need to go just to keep it going. So we'll tr see if I can get this one so that the speech sounds correct. I am the Edison Photograph. No matter what may be your mood, I am always ready to entertain you. When your day's work is done, I can bring the theater or the opera to your home. The name of my famous master is on my body and tells you that I am a genuine Edison photograph. The more you become a friend, 
quite like the way it sounded like a robot that was breaking down. Anyway, there you go. That's the Edison Gem. Okay, so that's my Edison Gem two minute machine, but really it's irrelevant to what we try to do here. I wanted to play this, this four minute cylinder and uh, that won't play it. Now, of course I could just stream the audio from this online. They've given me a link to it. I think they've given me a download link for an MP3 as well. I could play it as easy as that, which is what I was saying at the beginning, that this is merchandise, this is a novelty, this is a collectible, but yet a functional collectible if you have the right piece of equipment to play it back. And talking of that, I couldn't just leave this thing sitting on a shelf unplayable. I thought I'll have to go and get myself a four minute machine. So I spent quite a bit of time looking for one and uh, I, I really struck it lucky at a certain point because they were going for well over a thousand pounds if I could find them at all in the UK. And then I managed to get hold of one for, I don't know, perhaps about half that. It's been a while since I got it, but I still haven't played this on it because I wanted to wait until I made this video. So let me just go and get that machine out now. Right now, this is an Edison standard phonograph. The size difference between the two isn't anything to do with the four mini aspect. It's just that this was a, a bigger machine, a higher quality machine than the Edison Gem. That was the budget model. I think this was the standard one, hence the name. On the front of here, there's a metal bracket and that would have been to put a crane on it. I believe that's what they're called. If you were to hold a larger horn on the top, of course, you could get larger horns, which would increase the volume of it. The horn that came with this, I've got it down here, and um, somebody's kind of painted up this one. And I noticed it was really quite heavy. And in fact, when I tried playing some four minute cylinders that I got for this, it seemed to be dragging the stylus on the um, cylinder a little bit too much. So just the other day from India, this arrived, a, um, a brass one, I think it's brass, but it's a lot lighter than the other one. I mean, it's like a, a third of the weight. So I'm hoping this will make this thing sound even better. Again, I haven't tried that on it yet, but we'll just lift the top off here and I'll uh, just pop that down there. This is an interesting one because it came from a chap's house. He advertised on eBay, relatively local to me. And um, he said that you yeah, had to go and pick it up, which is one of the reasons why it was um, a, a lowish price. But I went to his house and he led me into the room to, to show it to me. And he had a room full of these machines all around the top of the room. He had shelving, like just a sort of above head height and all around the circumference of the room. He had these cylinder machines, some really impressive ones with big wooden speakers, which I asked him about those. And apparently those provide the best quality of sound. Again, I'm no expert in this at all. It was clear when I met this chap that I know nothing about this and there are people out there that know everything about it. So I'm not gonna come across here and try and pretend that I'm some guy who can tell you all about Edison cylinder machines because I don't know very much about them at all. But yeah, really impressive. Now I couldn't take any pictures and he's not the kind of guy that wants any publicity or to appear on camera or his collection to be shared with anyone. So I can, I can only describe it to you, I'm afraid. But yeah, that was all around the top of the room. He had all these cylinder machines, a lot of them with very impressive cranes hanging from the roof with massive like horns on them about this big. And then a lower part of the room, load of 78 machines he had, um, again, mechanical 78s. And I asked him, I said, do, uh, is this uh, just a hobby or, I mean, do you have like mo a more modern hi-fi somewhere, you know, where my interest really lies? He said, no, he wouldn't play any music. I think he said after 1950, <laughs> I think he said, he, it's only pre, you know, pre, I think he, yeah, no, he might even mention pre-war, but yeah, he basically, uh, all his music was on cylinders and 78s. He had a wall of 78s uh, just like stacked up and, he was interested in the kind of jazz and blues type of stuff in amongst them. But yeah, it was an in incredibly impressive collection for one guy to get. And that's the reason he had this machine. Him and a friend who apparently were collectors of these things heard about a collection of another chap that was being sold off in, I think it was in the London area. So they traveled to London and bought these, the collection uh, because they wanted one particular machine out of it. And in amongst the other things, they had, there was this, which he didn't need because it was identical to a model he'd already got. And the model he'd already got was in better condition than this. So he didn't need to, neither did his friend. So that's why he kind of got rid of it at a relatively low price. He just needed it gone, which was my advantage because I've got it here now. So I think what we should do with this, I just want to make sure it's playing all right with this horn. So we'll try playing a 
another four minute cylinder I've got, or a couple of those, just to check it's all right. And then we'll move on and play the Nameless Dreamers cylinder and see what that sounds like. Right, now this model, I believe, is from 1908 or thereabouts. Looking at the Antique Fono website, they go on about this sloped case, and this one has a gear that you pull in or out, depending upon whether you're playing a two minute or a four minute cylinder. And that's the gear there, and that's the sloped cover there. So I think this is a Model B from 1908. So yeah, pretty modern one, this one, <laughs> I'm only joking. Right, now it's, it's, you can see it's a little bit more pitted perhaps than the other one. Let's just take the um, reproducer out of here and just have a look at that because the, um, the chap when he sold this to me, he just popped this in there and you can see there that says Model H four minute. And I think he just had a few of these lying around, so he just popped this one in there. I don't know if it's a particularly good one or not. Okay, so similarly, we've got the handle on the side here. That is the brake, as well as the speed control. If I just move it gently, I'll be able to adjust the speed on that one. I think with this one, I've got a bit more chance of getting the speed right. So uh, we'll put a cylinder on from somebody else first, and then we'll try the one that we've got this thing to play. So let me just go and find a four minute cylinder. Now you'll notice that these are colored blue, which means they were made after 1912. There were black four minute cylinders made from 1908 up till 1912, and maybe there were some outside there, but I can understand why you'd want to color them blue because it just differentiates these two. You know which one's a four minute cylinder and which one's a two. Right, so let's try playing one of these. So what have we got here? We've got a few different uh, types of music. This one, La Bella Cubanera. Maybe it's uh, Cuba Bayon, but an early version of it. Let's try that. You don't want to overwind these things, but you don't want to underwind them, otherwise they won't get all the way through a cylinder. So I'm, I think that's about right. And it's just the same as the other one. This part pops open, the cylinder goes on with the text on the outside, and uh, just fits in place like that. Uh, let's, uh, let's give this a go. Not going so well so far. Let's move it along a bit. I think it might be an idea to try another one. I think that needle just isn't pushing down hard enough. I'm going to put a bit of blue tack on it. I don't know whether Edison recommended blue tack or white tack, I should say, as a solution to this, but let's, let's just try that out. Just add a bit more weight to it, put some more tracking force on it. Now, I'm not knowledgeable enough about these things to determine what's going on there. It might be the worm gear just isn't pulling it correctly. It seems to be sort of a different speed to the actual disc itself. Ha! Ah, I've just thought maybe it's this gear, maybe the gear's not in the right place. Let's try that again. I had the gear the wrong way. I had it in the two minute setting rather than the four minute. So what it was doing, it was jumping its way along the cylinder quicker than it should have been doing. So that demonstrates how much the worm gear is in charge of the playback. Right, let's wind it up, give it another go. I'll tell you what, there's gonna be antique Fono experts absolutely livid with this video, but it's not really for them. So I'm just playing about here. Right, got it in the right position. Let's give it another go. <laughs> enough of that one. Wow, it's giving me a headache. I'm sure someone really loved that back in the day. Apologies to all the big fans of uh, this artist. Let's find out who they were. Yeah, it's the Palms by C.W. Harrison. So yeah, all pop out to your local Tower Records or Virgin Megastore 
and go get one of these. Let's just try something, hopefully, a little bit more fun. What's this one? Uh, Salome. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's seen more opera stuff. So we'll go back to that first one. Ah. Special E scenes that are brightest Fantasia. Saxophone, in brackets, Henton. Well, that sounds better, doesn't it? Let's give that one a go. I've got to be honest, this one is sounding better now than the two minute one, especially with this new horn that's on here. So let's have another listen. you one thing that I want to do with this which um, it might be taking too long out of this section so maybe I'll just play it over the end credits but I really wanted to play that Edison advertising cylinder on this one uh, swap over this for a two minute reproducer put it into the two minute mode and uh, see if we can hear the whole thing this time oh care for a look inside let's just uh, take that off there Got to remove the handle to get in here, that just unscrews, and then the top hinges up. And there we go. There's a big screw loose down there, that's, that's not a good thing, is it? I have to figure out where that's supposed to go. I've got to say, this would be a great place to hide a stash back in the day. I wonder if anyone's ever found anything interesting inside one of these. Of course, this is all interesting, the mechanism, but you know what I mean. Let's just turn it on for a second. You can see there the governor moving outwards. Let's just stop it, see how it moves out from the centre to maintain a constant speed. So you can see the speed control here, full open, that's running as fast as it can now. But if I move it this way, it'll push against this washer, and that's pulling the whole thing to the left there. And then at a certain point it will stop. But anywhere in between those two positions, I can adjust the speed. Of course, the spinning of this is keeping it constant. Other than that, we've got this large section at the back which will have the uh, spring in it and various different cogs and things that move their way up to the top. I can't really tell you any more than that, other than we've got the belt on the left there. <laughs> Doesn't need a new belt in this one, and that's just what's going up to the top there and spinning the cylinder on the top. So I'll just uh, pop that closed now, so you just have to lift it up. It's like a car bonnet, really. And there we go. Okay, so finally, it's time for the moment that I've been waiting a year for. I'm going to be listening to Nameless Dreamer's Cylinder, which includes Bejeweled Grotto backed with Exploring Quartz Temple. So there you go, it's taken me a year to play this cylinder, but you've got to bear in mind that it has taken this particular machine 113 years before it could play it. 1908 machine, 2021 cylinder, courtesy of the Nameless Dreamers. So there we go, mission accomplished. Now, since I was sent this for free by the group, I put that paid promotion thing on at the beginning. I just want to mention something about that because it seems like a lot of people aren't quite following this rule. If you upload something to YouTube, you get a page about paid promotion. It says, if you accepted anything of value from a third party to make your video, you must let us know. We'll show viewers a message telling them that your video contains paid promotion. And you have to put a little tick in a box that says, my video contains paid promotion, like a product placement, sponsorship, or endorsement. 
There are loads of videos I see where people are reviewing things that they were sent for free and it doesn't say paid promotion on them. On the other hand, there's people like, uh, there's a channel that I watched where they review cars, Auto Fuel. Thomas there, he always has paid promotion on it. He's not getting a car for free, but he's been given consideration to maybe transport him to somewhere, probably get a free lunch or whatever. So he's put it on there. There are people who are very honest about this and a lot who aren't. Anyway, just a little rant I wanted to mention there because whenever I put that paid promotion thing, I'll get complaints from people saying, oh, you've been paid to make this video. No, I got a free cylinder record that cost me, I don't know, another 500, 600 quid to play. So it probably didn't work out in my favour in the end, but I've got to tick that box. Right, now the fact that I got this a year ago is quite relevant now because whilst I couldn't play it a year ago, it wouldn't be much use if I made a video about it because they sold out of these immediately. Now, the group Nameless Dreamers got back in touch with me recently and said, how am I getting on with playing this cylinder? They knew at the time I didn't have an appropriate machine and yet they still sent it on anyway. They said, well, maybe in the future you'll get one. And they were right, I did. Now, this is being re-released and it should be available around about the time you're watching this video from uh, a website that I'll put a link to in the video description. Now, this uh, Nameless Dreamers duo also release other uh, music on formats that's pretty hard to play. For example, they've, uh, they did a three and a half inch uh, floppy disk before this, and this was called a severe mountain path. They're all sort of based around like adventure game type themes. And they've given me a download code for that. Of course, I didn't use it. I thought I'll play the, the three and a half inch floppy. So on there, there's a, a JPEG, there's an MP3 and there's a text file. And the MP3 is 48 kilobits a second. Uh, they've, they like putting the music on things that uh, quite a lot of people would have difficulty in playing. But I think this one really takes the biscuit. But if you want a cylinder record for your cylinder record machine, as long as it's a four minute one, well, you might want to get hold of one of these. I'll put a link in the video description. I open this video by rambling rather incoherently about how a lot of artists are now treating physical music releases more as merchandise than a way to get their music out there. I mean, it's a bit of both, but when it comes to releasing stuff on cassettes, it seems to be more into the kind of novelty merchandise area. Vinyl, a lot of different coloured vinyl records and things. Uh, CDs, probably still more listened to than not if someone's buying a CD. But it's a bit of a mixture of things, and things are definitely shifting, it feels, over to maybe physical being just a, a novelty for a lot of people rather than some way that they would listen to music. And uh, this particularly, I mean, this is a novelty. It's a fun idea and I enjoyed having a play around with it and have a listen to it as well. And it gave me an excuse to talk about these cylinder uh, record players. Uh, but this is taking things to the extreme. You can kind of laugh at something like this now and go, oh, I'll imagine someone issuing a new music on a cylinder record. But when you think about it, at one point, if you'd have issued your music on a cylinder record, that would have been pretty much the only way that you could have released your pre-recorded music. And even going back to more recent times in my life, it doesn't feel all that long ago, I know it probably is, but when I could have lent anyone I knew a VHS videotape of something I'd recorded off the TV and know that they would have been able to play it, like guaranteed, you wouldn't ask, oh, do you have a video recorder? Someone would say, oh, have you got that on tape? Yeah, and just pass them the tape, and you know that they'd be able to play it. Uh, then again, they've asked for it, so they probably would be able to play it, but you know what I mean. Everyone I knew had a video recorder, and yet now, I couldn't give a video tape to anyone I know and expect them to be able to play it. I'm pretty sure none of them would have a video player still set up under the TV. And it's getting a bit that way when it comes to any other kind of pre-recorded media. Just imagine now you're a band and you want to issue a um, album on a format that you know everyone will be able to play. Well, the only way to do that would be perhaps streaming because uh, when it comes to physical formats, well, at one point you'd have issued it on a CD. Yeah, everyone can play a CD. But just think now, I'm getting older <laughs> or old and younger generations than myself, they probably don't have a single disc spinning type device in the home. Uh, I mean, yeah, I know there's people who sort of get into vinyl, vinyls and stuff and buy like a little cheap Crosley record player. But just your average person who's growing up, getting a house for the first time, 
they probably just have a streaming box under the TV to watch all the movies and things. Uh, they've got no need to have even a Blu-ray or a DVD player. Now, people like myself, I've got all the weird equipment, but uh, as you get older, you might get rid of your hi-fi, your mini system, or your CD player, but you can still probably play a disc in something. You've got your DVD or your Blu-ray, but younger people, no, they probably won't have. And that'll increase as time goes on. So the number of households where you could give someone a CD and say, oh yeah, there's my latest album CD. The amount of them that could be able to play that now is, is diminishing and will do over time. So it's got to get to the same stage of giving someone a cylinder record and expecting them to play it. Yes, it will take a long time to get to that, but it's just something to think about that physical media now is moving across into becoming a bit of a weird novelty. And at some point in your lifetime, if you're able to play a CD, people might think you're a little bit odd and old fashioned. Um, so anyway, that's just something to think about. Don't think about it too hard. It might make you feel a bit sad. But I think what we'll do, I just want to play you out with that Edison demonstration cylinder on this one. And uh, just a side note here, cylinders are the only music format, pre-recorded music format, that I can comfortably play the audio from on this channel without fear of hitting a content match. Now, I'm sure it could happen if somebody did some weird licensing agreement and re-released one and put it in the database and all that. But in general... I could play a cylinder and it won't hit any content match because it's outside that period of time in which you get into that kind of copyright type stuff. Get into the 78s, even the mechanical ones, and some of those are hitting content matches and are still within the period where I wouldn't be allowed to play the music from and someone is uh, getting money from the rights for those. Uh, that just shows you what state we're in at the moment. Cylinder records, I can put as many of those on the channel as I want and not worry about hitting content matches, but any newer than cylinders, whew, no, still have to pay for those. Anyway, just thought you might find that interesting. Uh, that's it for the moment. Uh, I'll play you out with the cylinder, but uh, as always, thanks for watching. I am the Edison Phonograph, created by the great wizard of the new world to delight those who would have melody or be amused. I can sing you tender songs of love. I can give you merry tales the joy of laughter. I can transport you to the realms of music. I can cause you to join in the rhythmic dance. I can lull the babes in sweet repose or waken in the aged heart soft memories of youthful days. No matter what may be your mood, I am always ready to entertain you. When your day's work is done, I can bring the theater or the opera to your home. I can give you grand opera, comic opera, or vaudeville. I can give you sacred or popular music, band, orchestra, or instrumental music. I can render solos, duets, trios, or tests. I can aid in entertaining your guests. When your wife is worried after the cares of the day and the children are boisterous, I can rest the one and quiet the other. I never get tired, and you will never tire of me, for I always have something new to offer. I give pleasure to all, young and old. I will go wherever you want me, in the parlor, in the sick room, on the porch, in the camp, or to your summer home. If you sing or talk to me, I will retain your songs or words and repeat them to you at your pleasure. I can enable you to always hear the voices of your loved ones, even though they are far away. I talk in every language. I can help you to learn other languages. I am made with the highest degree of mechanical skill. My voice is the clearest, smoothest, and most natural of any talking machine. The name of my famous master is on my body and tells you that I am a genuine Edison phonograph. The more you become acquainted with me, the better you will like me. Ask the dealer.